Local programming on KRWG Public Media made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. This is KRWG Public Media, TV, radio, online, news that matters. Now, across the Mesilla Valley and the borderland, the stories that shape our community. From the KRWG Broadcast Center at New Mexico State University, this is Newsmakers. Thank you for joining us on this edition of Newsmakers. I'm Madison Staten. Pilot programs introducing a guaranteed basic income are in development right here in the state of New Mexico. We're joined by Madeline Naley, Director of Guaranteed Income at the Economic Security Project, to talk more about what this means for our region. Thanks for joining us this morning. Thanks so much for having me. Let's start with the basics. What would a guaranteed basic income program look like if implemented on the state level here in New Mexico? Well, so far, most guaranteed income pilot programs have been at the municipal level. So we have very few state examples to draw from. New Mexico would really be leading in that area. We do have uh, the Alaska Permanent Fund Dividend that we can learn from. So since the early 80s, that's been paying out annually to every Alaskan resident. And we know that has a huge impact on the populations there. It has lowered childhood obesity, increased nutrition. It has really great outcomes, predominantly um, for low income and indigenous populations. We see the biggest uptick in health and uh, well being there. Well, you presented to the New Mexico State Legislature in the summer of 2021. Can you talk to me about your advocacy work on the state level here in New Mexico? Yes, yeah, so I was introduced to that um, opportunity through Las Cruces City Council member Johanna Bencomo, who's an advocate for guaranteed income in her community and the state. So was brought in to talk about what we've been seeing uh, nationally with guaranteed income. So what pilot programs are currently in the works within the state? Can you sort of walk me through what's going on right now? Yeah, so in Santa Fe, there's the SF LEAP, which is the Learn, Earn, Achieve program, which is uh, going to start dispersing in August 20, or it started in August 2021 and is still active. And there were a couple that recently closed. There were two programs through New Mexico Appleseed um, for students who were experiencing, experiencing homelessness, and these were basic income stipends. And um, so in the works is a proposal in the city of Las Cruces that uh, Council Member Ben Como has been spearheading as well. It's wonderful to hear. So nationally, where have guaranteed income pilot programs been successful? Right now, we have close to 100 guaranteed income demonstrations around the country, um, either in active planning or started. Now, the best known probably is the Stockton Economic Empowerment Demonstration uh, that launched a couple years ago. We were big supporters of then Mayor Michael Tubbs um, in that program. That provided $500 a month to 125 Stocktonians for two years. We have the first year data set out showing what a benefit that was. And then we also have the Magnolia Mothers Trust down in Jackson, Mississippi, which is the longest running guaranteed income program in the United States. And that focuses on black women living in subsidized housing in Jackson, Mississippi. They're on their third cohort right now. We also can draw uh, from the success of the child tax credit and the huge impact it's had on child hunger and poverty. Now, when the check stopped coming, 40% of children fell back under the poverty line. Wow, so what about cost? How does a state like New Mexico make a program like this sustainable? Absolutely, and that's really the key. So I think there are several ways to do this, including progressive taxation, dividend funds like that used in Alaska. However, when we talk about sustainability, we recognize that a federal guaranteed income would offer the most benefit and the most access to pay fors to make sure that happens. One of the clear economic policy lessons of the pandemic has been that cash policies are the most effective and efficient ways to help people who are struggling. These programs are an investment in our economy and future generations, and that pays back dividends. So critics of guaranteed basic income say it can lead to a decreased incentive to work. What are your thoughts on that? 
So I have thoughts, but I also have data. The Stockton Economic Empowerment Demonstration found that people receiving the guaranteed income were more likely to have full-time employment at the end of the study than folks who didn't. We know that a little economic cushion gives you the space to take those risks to get that better paying job. You can take that unpaid internship or a class um, to, to help you move up the economic ladder. So actually a guaranteed income has been shown to have people attach more into better positions in the labor market. So what would your message be to critics? We know that a guaranteed income supports individuals and families. It builds stronger communities. It allows folks to achieve their green, dreams, to you know, provide for themselves and their families, and to chase those jobs that they want so that they can be really active in their communities. Well, according to the U.S. Census, approximately 23.6% of Las Cruces residents live in poverty. How could a guaranteed basic income program help to reduce a statistic like that? Well, we saw it with the child tax credit, as I was saying. So, you know, from July into December of last year, most American families were receiving that child tax credit monthly. And what we found is that it severely reduced child poverty and childhood hunger. And when those checks stopped, people fell right back into that poverty and that hunger. So we know we have the data and we have the proof that providing a little bit of economic security goes a really long way to, to stabilizing families. Well, when you take the temperature of New Mexico lawmakers, how hesitant are they to embrace this or are they all for it? I can't speak to that. I know that there are great advocates in the state and I'm hopeful that folks will see the power and benefit of this program. So why should New Mexicans advocate for a program like this one? Again, we have the data, we have the stories, we know how powerful it is to give that bit of economic security to families that are struggling. And we see what it does, again, to individuals and families, but much larger to a community and hopefully to a state. So what do you believe are the key takeaways for our audience to really understand about this issue? I think we can take away that guaranteed income is a lifeline to folks. It provides an opportunity to find that better job, to quit working that third job and spend time with your kids. We have stories of parents in Stockton who found out their kids knew how to swim because they were able to take them to swim lessons. They had a little extra breathing room. It improves mental well-being. We know statistically people who receive the guaranteed income are more likely to, to be healthier, have better well-being, report that. There are better parent-child outcomes. Uh, it increases birth weights. Cash to folks allows people to live the life of dignity that we all deserve. And so what drives you to fight for this day in and day out? Where does that passion come from? I believe that every individual has dignity, and I believe that we all have a shared responsibility to ensure that our neighbors live full, robust lives. And I want a world of abundance. I believe in a world of abundance in which we all have what we need to thrive and live together. Well, thank you so much for coming on the program today. Thank you for having me. Now we turn to a report from KRWG's Noah Race to learn more about local efforts to implement a guaranteed basic income pilot program. Many undocumented immigrants living in the United States were left out of vital government assistance during the COVID-19 pandemic. Missing out on programs such as unemployment and Social Security can quickly become overwhelming for these families. To help address this issue, private organizations have launched the New Mexico Guaranteed Basic Income Pilot Project for Immigrant Families. And we are targeting 330 undocumented uh, or immigrant or mixed status families around the state. This is uh, to give uh, families $500 for a year. NM Cafe community organizer Viviana Arseniega is assisting the organization by helping sign people up for the statewide pilot project. I'm hoping that this is going to help uh, people who are normally excluded from uh, traditional um, economic relief programs in the state to maybe get out of debt um, uh, with finances, buying food, um, maybe help with education or making decisions around uh, family's health. While the monthly payments currently being given out to undocumented immigrants in New Mexico are led by private foundations, local governments are paying close attention. 
At the end of the year, uh, survey all these families and see how uh, it helped it, this money helped them and their families, and maybe expanded not just to um, immigrants, but also expanded to through the throughout the entire state uh, for low-income families, families who are struggling, uh, no, no matter how. Las Cruces City Councilor Joanna Bencomo says ideas like this are needed to replace outdated government assistance. Social welfare programs as they exist now, SNAP, TANF, housing vouchers, are really outdated. I mean, when the New Deal passed, it was such a long time ago, it was such a different time, families' needs were so different. Inherently, these programs do not trust people in poverty, and they say, the federal government gets to tell you how how you're gonna spend your money and when you're gonna spend your money. And GBI says completely the opposite. It says, you know your family best. Here is this direct cash payment. One aspect of the statewide guaranteed basic income pilot project that is unique is the assistance is available to people with undocumented or mixed immigration status, since they are often not eligible for assistance programs. I had the opportunity to speak with one such individual who asked us only to use her first name. Nuestra situación como nadie, como no tenemos ayuda de nadie, uh, es trabajar en lo que, en lo que haya. To make ends meet, families like Blancas may have to take on difficult jobs and work long hours. Pues uno de los obstáculos es por ser fam uh, familia inmigrante, los trabajos son muy pesados por trabajar en el campo o la construcción. Y pues es muy mala paga. El idioma, no saberlo al 100%, es otro obstáculo. El seguro social, o sea, son pocos de los obstáculos que tenemos nosotros. Supporters of the New Mexico Guaranteed Basic Income Pilot Project hope the study will show participants will have easier access to essential items such as food, rent, utilities, and more. Oh, me, ayuda, me va a ayudar mucho en proporcionar. Mm, alimento para mis hijos y poder apoyarlos un poquito más en su educación ya que tengo uno en colegio y tengo un otro hijo en high school. I understand why people think this is a radical idea. For me there's nothing radical about finally implementing something real that can actually end poverty in our communities. As the idea gains traction around the country, only time will tell how the New Mexico Guaranteed Basic Income Pilot Project for Immigrant Families will affect the participants' lives. For KRWG Public Media, this is Noah Race. To further discuss guaranteed basic income, we're joined by New Mexico State University economist Chris Erickson. Thanks for joining us today, Chris. My pleasure. Always happy to come on. Well, what can you tell us about the history of guaranteed basic income in the state of New Mexico? Guaranteeing basic income is an idea that goes back uh, in, uh, believe it or not, 1972 when Nixon ran against McGovern. Uh, there was uh, uh, one of the only things that the two of them agreed on was, was something that back then they called negative income tax, but today we call basic income. Here in New Mexico, there's recently been a, uh, a program in uh, Santa Fe where they've given $400 a month to um, uh, community college students um, in an experiment to see how that affects their um, uh, behavior. Um, and that plan is starting to get quite a bit of headway here in the state. It was, it was uh, subject of uh, legislative hearings and um, uh, it's an idea uh, that seems to be gaining momentum, although starting from a very slow stop, and but gaining momentum as it, at, at, uh, moving forward. Well, do you think a statewide guaranteed basic income program could be successful in our state? Well, I'm a big advocate of guaranteed income uh, programs and basic income programs uh, because they provide a type of incentive for work that isn't provided often in, um, in, in other types of programs that provide income support. So many income support programs are, 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 are contingent on the income of the recipient, meaning the recipient has an incentive not to work because if they do work and if they do earn too much income, they'll lose, they will no longer be qualified for, this, for the program that they're, that they're enrolled in. Basic income doesn't work that way. Basic income just provides a basic income to everybody, regardless of whether you're working or not working or, or going to school or not going to school or what have you. 
And so it, it doesn't distort the incentives for work. It doesn't distort the incentives for getting an education the same way that, that more traditional programs that are contingent on income do. Well, do you think that state lawmakers are willing to embrace GBI? Well, it, there's a lot of, uh, of moving parts to switching from uh, uh, traditional programs to a, a guaranteed basic income. And uh, for example, uh, if I were doing it, and, and, I, and I will tell people, if they're not aware of this, and I'm a market-oriented economist, sometimes I tell people I'm a libertarian, sometimes I don't say that because libertarians can be interpreted as being a little bit nutty, not to, to insult those libertarians out there. But libertarians and other conservatives have long advocated for basic income if it replaces existing programs, not if it expands uh, expands government and so what you to, to implement a program what you need to do is cut back on other types of support um, and then use the funding that went to those other programs like food stamps um, uh, uh, like uh, subsidies for uh, tuition at state universities and there are a number of other programs that are large parts of the state budget <coughs> excuse me there are large parts of the state budget that would need to be uh, that would need to be uh, uh, cut back to fund the basic income program, and that's going to be politically difficult. Um, it, it you're cutting programs some of which are very popular and replacing them with a program that hasn't really been tried uh, very extensively here in the United States. Um, that said, it would be a more efficient a better way to provide the kind of basic, the kind of support that we want to provide people with low incomes. You know, I don't think anybody wants to see, uh, uh, for example, children um, not having access to to meet their basic needs, um, people who are disabled not having uh, income to meet their basic needs, and so on. And so, um, it is a program that will require a dramatic change in the way that we run state government. And it'll be it'll take a lot of work to get the legislators on board to do that. So what are your thoughts on the critique that this type of program decreases the incentive to work? Well, yes and no. Um, it, 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 and I, I, I could get really wonky here and say, well, uh, theoretically, of course, it could do that. If you have an income and you know you're going to have enough to meet your basic needs, then, of course, we're all uh, the, the lazy people won't work. But I don't think that most people are lazy. I think that most people, in fact, are um, hardworking. They want to have a job. They get a lot of their uh, personal self-worth from their work. And um, for that reason, I think it might have a small effect on the willingness of people to work, but much less than a lot of people think it would. Um, and so I think that this is not a, a big issue. Moreover, for those people who are currently receiving support already, they face a big disincentive to work because if they work, they're going to lose eligibility for the programs that they're involved in. Uh, uh, you know, for example, food stamps. If you have a, uh, a if you reach a particular income uh, threshold, you lose food stamps, and that gives you an incentive not to work, not to put in extra hours at work because you're afraid of losing food stamps or some. And there are many other programs that are the same way as this. Um, and so, um, I uh, sometimes it's referred to as the benefit clip. That if you go up, your income goes up a little bit you lose a lot in benefits. And, and um, that is, um, uh, that's a much larger disincentive for work than is a basic income. Well, do you think that a long-term program can be economically sustainable? Well, it, it, it can be as long as we fund it by reducing um, funding to other programs that are, um, uh, that currently are used to support uh, people living in poverty to provide them with basic, their basic needs. I've mentioned food stamps, but there uh, are other programs along the same lines um, that are income contingent. And if we eliminate those programs, and by the way, that also means eliminating the, the, the salaries of the bureaucrats that run those programs, and that means reducing employee, employment by state government. 
um, if we do those, if we make those hard changes, uh, basic income can be a better way to uh, provide for the needs of the of the, the poor. And I'd also say that we would that we probably would want to also increase the taxes on the rich to partly pay for this because we're of course with a basic uh, income program, you're giving income to everybody, whether they're a millionaire or a or a street sweeper. Um, uh, uh, you're giving income to everyone. And that means that um, you uh, that that um, I think most people think that we really don't want to subsidize the rich in the same way. And so you get around that by um, having a little bit higher income tax. The total cost to New Mexico of the program that's being talked about, which is $400 per month, that's what they did in Santa Fe. The total cost would be about $800 million, which is about 11% of the state budget. And um, and so uh, if we want to if we want to um, uh, deal with the if we want to um, um, uh, fund this, we would want to cut back in other parts by that $800 million. Uh, again, uh, and by the way, I should also mention if we want to make sure that everyone's above the poverty line, the actual cost would be closer to $600 a month, not 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 $400 a month. And of course, that would be that would be 12 million, uh, 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 1.2 billion dollars in cost, rather than the 800 million I just talked about. And so, um, uh, it, if if this were to result just in a larger government, I think the program would be a failure. But if it results in a a different way of doing business that that provides better incentives for people to work that um, make sure that everyone is in fact um, uh, um, uh, has a basic income, then I think it would be a, a better way to go. And I, I'll just mention one other thing too. And they have a program like this, uh, they don't call it basic income, but it's very similar to a basic income program in Alaska. And it's funded out of, uh, out of oil revenues that go to the state. Um, and what they basically do is they take those oil revenues and they rebate them uh, to everyone who is a resident of Alaska. And it's not it's not uh, in, it's not uh, 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 tested for income. It's not income tested. And the problem with that program, of course, is that some people are attracted to live in Alaska simply to get those benefits, and then other people are, particularly people who used to live in Alaska but are now living primarily somewhere else they're very tempted not to change their residence so they can continue to get those benefits. And that's a problem because um, it, it, it does mean that people who moved to New Mexico would be eligible for the basic income right away when they get here. We have to figure out some way to work around that problem. Well, what do you think that our audience needs to most understand about this topic today? Well, I think the thing that you need to understand the most about this topic is that, that, um, um, uh, it, is that this does not mean an expansion of government necessarily. This is instead of other programs, and those other programs really provide disincentives to work that is that are that are not disincentives that are that are part of uh, the basic uh, uh, basic uh, income. And um, uh, yes, if you provide income to people, there are some people that might cut back on the hours they work. But it's also true that most people. Um, that, that, that those disincentives at work will generally be less than the current system. Do you think that New Mexicans should be advocating for a program like this one? Well, I do. I advocate for it. I think this is a better way to go. Uh, the, it, it is a, a less uh, distorting of the system because everyone gets the benefits regardless of how they behave. And so they don't have the disincentive of seeking to avoid that benefit cliff by working extra hours or by taking a job that pays better or maybe by I, I, taking a promotion at work that disqualifies them for a program and then the loss of benefits is so substantial that it makes the additional work or the higher responsible job or whatever it is worth it and and so that's not a problem with basic income because everybody gets it. everybody gets it and it and that means that they don't have to worry about um, 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 uh, they don't have to we don't have to worry about people um, making decisions in order to maintain their eligibility because
because there is no decision they need to make to maintain their eligibility. Wonderful. Thank you for joining us today, Chris. I so appreciate it. My pleasure. Always happy to do it. Well, that's our time for now. Join us this week on KRWG Radio every weekday. It's Morning Edition 5 to 9, Fresh Air at 11, followed by Here and Now, Noon to 2, and All Things Considered 4 to 7. KRWG News is always online at krwg.org, and we'd love to hear from you. Email us with story ideas and video submissions. The address is feedback at nmsu.edu. For all of us at KRWG News, I'm Madison Staten. Have a great week. We'll see you next time on Newsmakers.